Thank you very much. So the, the webinar really um, is, a, is a very topical one, uh, addressing the global water challenge uh, yes. through autonomous irrigation. And uh, it's, uh, it's an, an area where I, I think we can all identify the importance of water. Insights from um, Australian experience today uh, in the seminar. Um, I'd like to uh, first up invite uh, um, the Secretary General from ICID, Ashwin Pandya, just to say a few words of welcome to us all. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And it's my great pleasure to be here at, uh, at this webinar on addressing the global water challenge through autonomous irrigation. Uh, we really look forward to the progress that uh, Australia has made uh, in, in this area, which is a very vital area as the number of people engaged in agriculture go down, but simultaneously the requirements for the productivity and the requirements for various other inputs go on increasing. And also with the climate change, the policies are required to become more and more dynamic. And for the dynamism and for the quick response, the autonomous irrigation forms a very vital component of the entire value chain. So from this angle, I feel that this is a very, very apt seminar and uh, we will be having a very good, uh, uh, we are having very good uh, faculty uh, who are eminent in their own right, as Professor John Hornbuckle, Professor Foley, who also was with us in our earlier training programs, and also he has worked a lot on this ED research, uh, uh, the, the, the remote sensing based water management uh, projects, and uh, Professor uh, Foley, uh, Professor Jay Foley, also from the from Australia. So I I would I would be very happy to learn a lot from this very informative webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ashwin, for that. Uh, this uh, we'd like to hope is a uh, is the first in a series of webinars uh, from Irrigation Australia. Um, as a build up towards our uh, international conference, many of you will be aware that uh, the international conference. Um, of Irrigation Australia was going to be combined with the ICED International yeah, Congress yeah. here in uh, in Australia in September this year, but due to uh, COVID and travel restrictions, that has uh, had to be postponed. But we're looking forward to hearing very soon about the uh, plans for the uh, the new date, which will be announced very soon about this uh, conference. And we look forward to having a number of these webinars as a build up uh, towards this conference. The theme of the conference will be innovation and research in agricultural water management to achieve sustainable development goals. So the topic of our discussion today is very much aligned with that. And we really do look forward to welcoming you all here in Australia on that date to combine the experiences of the International uh, Commission for Irrigation and Drainage participants and ourselves um, to share uh, our field tours, to share socially, and to uh, share our knowledge and te technical information. Australia is the driest continent on the earth. Efficient use of water is paramount for us. And uh, so what better place to come together for this big event, uh, which will be announced shortly. Part of that, uh, that theme are a number of sub-themes, which I put up here really to uh, prompt you to think about submitting a paper. And uh, you can see the web link there uh, whereby you can connect in and you can lodge your abstracts. You know, we're looking for information on uh, the role of information and communication to help adopt research outcomes. The role of multidisciplinary dialogue to achieve sustainable development goals. What are the future tools for managing uncertainty? These are all very important issues in terms of sustainable irrigation. So please uh, have a look at the, uh, the links uh, and uh, start considering to submit your abstracts so that we can look forward to sharing with you at our international event. Today's webinar is really uh, strongly aligned with what I've just outlined of those research questions. Um, and it's, it's based on a program which has been run nationally uh, in Australia. Uh, it's a program under the auspices of a, a range of different industries, 
sugar, cotton, grains, dairy, rice, many research organizations funded by the Australian government through its Department of Agriculture, Water and in the Environment. And it is really looking at smart irrigation to encourage profit and sustainability of our uh, agricultural sector. Uh, the program is building on earlier work that was done, which was focused more on getting the basics right, which really showed that there's some significant improvements that can be made by looking at best practice, by looking at precision irrigation. But we're now really focusing strongly on uh, new and innovative technologies, sensing technologies, control technologies, precision irrigation, scheduling, automation. And that's what we are very fortunate today to be hearing a little bit from participants in that program to, uh, to uh, tell us a little bit about some of their learnings. So briefly, before I hand over, uh, that is the program for, for today. Um, I will shortly hand over to uh, Associate Professor John Hornbuckle and then uh, Associate Professor Joseph Foley, who will give us some, some highlights of the work that they were doing. We then have a panel discussion and we've been fortunate to be joined by two of the farmers, the leading farmers who are adopting technology. Research is only good when the technology is adopted. And uh, so we will share the, the insights of James and Aaron in terms of their farming operations. And there are a number of videos that you can connect to after this webinar to have a look at some of their farming operations. There are a number of pre-prepared questions we are using for the panel discussion. And then thereafter, we'll have an open Q&A from the audience. And given the large number of participants, uh, we urge you to use the question and chat box. That way we can select questions to put to the, uh, to the panel uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an orderly way. And then finally, we will close. So without further ado, I'd, I'd, I'd possibly introduce both of our speakers before handing over to, to John to make the first presentation. Uh, John. John Hornbuckle is the Associate uh, Professor uh, of the Center for Regional and Rural Futures at Deakin University. He's an irrigation and drainage engineer, and his main focus is on improving water use productivity in the irrigated agricultural environment, looking to minimize environmental impacts associated with irrigation. And he leads their irrigation research group at Deakin University. He's also involved in a number of international projects, looking at development agriculture in Cambodia and Laos. And uh, his work in this program is really focusing on uh, rice and cotton, precision irrigation, and using better sensing and spatial technologies. So we will look forward to John's presentation. But before I hand over to him, I will also introduce um, Joe Foley. Joe is the uh, Associate Professor at the Center for Agricultural Engineering. University of Southern Queensland. He's an irrigation and water management lead um, at the center, and much of his work is focused on technologies to automate broadacre irrigation. He leads a, a large national project focusing on autonomous irrigation systems, and uh, he's engaged in field sites all the way from northern Queensland in sugar through cotton in the central um, east coast, all the way down to pastures in Tasmania. And he'll be sharing uh, some of the technologies that he's in, applying in these systems. So at that point, then I will uh, hand over to 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 John, and and he will give us some of his insights uh, from his research work. Thank you, uh, John. Okay, you able to see my uh, presentation? Uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity today to talk. Um, it's always great to, to talk with other people that are involved with irrigation research development extension right across the globe. I've been very lucky in my career to have a number of opportunities to, to travel overseas and see what others are doing and also have, uh, have others come here and see what we're doing here in Australia. So um, welcome to this uh, first series of presentations like Eric mentioned that are associated with the, the irrigation conference that'll happen in Sydney um, next year. That'll be great to, uh, to catch up with old friends um, when, we, when, when you visit during that time. 
Uh, today, what I wanted to talk about was one of the current projects we have. Uh, it's funded by the federal government, um, the Cotton Research and Development Corporation in Agri Futures Australia. And it's known as the Smart Irrigation for Profit Program. And the specific topic that I'll be talking about today is around smart sensing and automation for irrigated rice and cotton production. This is really a team effort, so it's not just uh, me that's doing all this work. I'm very fortunate to have a, a great team that's, um, that's associated with me here at the Research Laboratory. So I'd just like to acknowledge Rodrigo, Carlos, Arben, and also Matt, um, who work on this project with me. One of the interesting aspects here in Australia as part of our research and development that we do, we work very closely with commercial farmers and you'll hear from, from some of those later today, but also very closely with, with industry as well. So on this project, we've got two industry partners and they take the technology that we're co-developing and then offer commercial packages out to, uh, out to end users, irrigators um, within the community. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Padman Automation who do the automation control and we'll have a look at some of that in the presentation later today. And also Goanna Ag who are involved in a lot of the sensing uh, technologies that we, that we use. So we'll just move on to the next slide. I'll talk a little bit of the outline of the talk, just so people can follow what, we've, what we're currently doing. Um, firstly, I'll give a little bit of background on the Australian irrigation scene. So essentially what irrigation looks like across the country, um, just very briefly. So you've got a little bit of background. I'll then talk about surface irrigation automation and the journey we've gone on um, here with the work that I've been involved with in Australia. I'll then go on to talk a little bit about some of the platforms developed, such as the Irisense Smart Sensing and Automation Platform that takes lots of these tools and technologies and integrates them um, into a package that, uh, that heads towards autonomous irrigation into the future. And then lastly, I'll finish up with just some future directions in smart sensing and automation that, um, that we feel has, um, has some unanswered questions moving, moving forward and also some of the opportunities that are, that are out there. So irrigation in Australia, to give you a quick snapshot of what it looks like, uh, most the majority of the irrigation occurs on the eastern seaboard. And within that, most of the irrigation or the majority of it is within the Murray-Darling Basin system, which you've probably heard about. Uh, Australia-wide, there's about uh, 2.6 million uh, irrigated hectares. So it's, um, it's significant, but quite small compared to, to some other countries for sure. Um, some of the issues that we have within Australia is that we have no cost labour, so labour is, is very expensive. And one of the other elements that I think is very different probably to a lot of people that are, that are listening from overseas is that our water is fully tradable. So that's driven a lot of the technology adoption and the really efficient use of water uh, within Australia. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like, the water market is essentially like a share market. So Water can be traded indefinitely um, and it can also be traded on a temporary basis. So just within an irrigation season. So you'll see this is a website, um, water exchange, which anyone throughout the world can get on. Um, anyone can actually own water. And so you can also trade that water like a stock as well. So if you have the ability to be able to save water, um, you have the ability to be able to use that to increase your irrigation area, but you also have the ability to be able to trade that and potentially make a profit off that as well. So basically, if you can save it, um, you can sell it. So it's a very valuable commodity and it's driven a lot of our um, irrigation uh, high tech adoption um, to be able to manage water as efficiently as we can. So what systems are we talking about? Today, I'll, I'll focus on two of the broad acre crops that we're involved with within the Southern Murray-Darling Basin, two of the major ones, which are cotton and rice. Um, so Australia is a very efficient producer of both cotton and rice. Um, I've just got some, um, a slide up there that, that shows um, uh, both cotton and rice. So you can see our yields per hectare um, are, are extremely high on both those um, irrigated commodities. To give you some background so you can put it in context for, for where you may be from, uh, field sizes are generally uh, for six to 40 hectares. Um, it's a semi-arid environment. So we have peak evapotranspiration around about 14 millimetres per day. And our soils are generally heavy clays um, or clay loams with low infiltration capacities. They're naturally very flat. 
So they're very suitable to surface irrigation. And indeed, in lots of cases, you'll see surface irrigation systems actually outperform some of the pressurized systems in, in these situations. As I mentioned, it's a naturally flat system, but we also undertake extensive laser leveling to get the fields very level so that water management um, is very precise and we get a very even application of water across those uh, six to 40 hectare um, irrigated bays. Um, we also have high irrigation inflow rates that are available. So that's one of the key things with surface irrigation is the ability to be able to put water on very quickly at very high flow rates that allows to get a lot of those efficiencies um, up using these surface irrigation methods. So I'll then now go on to outline what is uh, smart irrigation control and automation. So like I mentioned, it's much more than remote irrigation gate control. It's uh, thinking about um, what we've got there to be able to keep water use efficiency and integrating knowledge on maximising water and labour efficiency by providing automation control uh, based on a range of infield and remote feedback sensors and also uh, forecasted conditions and events um, which are there. So there are four key elements of these smart automation systems. Um, there's sensor networks which collect the sensor data. There's those communication networks which transfer that sensor data. And there's control hardware which controls the irrigation infrastructure. And then there's data analytics which are used then to, um, to uh, analyze the data and make decisions on, uh, on what's there. So this next slide uh, essentially just shows what the IRASense platform that we've developed looks like. So that incorporates both the sensing technology as well as the automation technology together. Um, so you can see the elements of those systems. So it consists of a seven to 14 day uh, forecast of weather parameters and crop water use parameters. And then it also uh, pulls in the real time sensing of the soil, the crop and the climate that's, that's currently there um, using a range of infield sensor um, networks, which I'll talk to you about later, and also a range of remote sensing, particularly using crop evapotranspiration from remote sensing. And that information is then used for predicting when we need to water um, and automating the irrigation systems. That data is then combined in an online sensing and automation control um, online cloud. And that's where the data analytics and the smarts of the system operate across that sensor data and then send information to the automation control structures. So within each one of these irrigation fields or these irrigation bays is some form of irrigation gate. And we'll show you a little bit of those later. And they're automated. So we're actually able to open and close those gates remotely and let water on and off the field. So we can reduce labor costs and also make sure we can tr control the water um, perfectly. Uh, these systems can also be linked into the irrigation delivery network. So within a lot of the systems, we have a two day water ordering period. So we can forecast uh, when we need to um, irrigate, order the water um, through the irrigation company or the SCADA uh, delivery infrastructure, and then um, have that water ready to available uh, based off that forecast data. So that's conceptually how the system works. And what I'll do now is just talk around each one of the individual elements um, that are there in these next slides. So for controlling the automation gates, so to give you an idea of uh, what was previously used pre-automation to what we use now, uh, if we actually have a look over here on the left of the, the slide, you'll see this is a, a typical um, inlet outlet on our surface irrigation system. Uh, it's generally some form of concrete uh, structure, and then it's got some form of ability to be able to hold the water back. So traditionally, these are actually with wooden boards that were about um, a four inch diameter, a four inch thickness that would be placed with inside the, the irrigation um, outlets, and that would then control water flows um, and uh, between bays. What we've now moved to is replacement of those wooden boards with a, a rubber gate that's actually controlled by a winch. So um, you'll actually have a hand winch. Um, if you can see me on the on the video, you'll see a, a, a hand winch that's, that's there. Um, that winch is actually used to wind up and down that rubber flat. And what it also allows us to do as well is to actually automate that winch. So we have units um, such as this, Padman Automation Seasonal Auto Winch. Um, so you can have a look at that um, there within the photo. It actually clicks onto the winch 
and then it controls that. So this unit has the ability to be able to be programmed um, within field. It can be controlled off your mobile phone and it can also be controlled off the cloud infrastructure so that we can actually automate the system fully off that sensor data and control it uh, fully through the cloud. So it's been really amazing where the, uh, where the irrigation technology has come from uh, today. Um, so instead of having to be out at three o'clock in the morning changing those boards, um, we can actually set that up to do it automatically and uh, stay in bed and have more sleep or get more jobs done around the farm. The costs of those seasonal auto winches as well um, is also quite attractive and I'll come and talk a little bit more about that cost structure on a per hectare basis um, for the Australian case in a little bit later. So that's the control side of things. Uh, one of the important elements of getting high irrigation uh, water use productivity and efficiencies is linking those control structures. So rather than just being a remote on and off, and making the same poor irrigation decisions you may make is including sensor data into that as well. So we use a range of sensor data, depending on what systems we're in, whether it's rice or cotton, and we use uh, soil moisture sensors, such as the, the watermark, which measures soil tension that are very good for automating off because they give an absolute value. Um, also capacitance-based probes, where we duly measure things like soil and water heights, and also ultrasonic um, water measurement, where we're measuring water heights, for example, within rice bays, and then maintaining that water height over time. Some of the challenges that we have within the automation space are repeatability and sensor drift, and also environmental factors are challenging elements that really need important consideration in terms of how you, you automate the system. The last component that's uh, very important within these systems to get their, the maximum use out of is, is the forecast component of it. So as mentioned before, we use a range of uh, remote sensing technologies for rapid transpiration, um, use the IRISAT within um, that program to be actually able to predict crop water use and when we next need to irrigate. We also use that then as well to provide a, a soil moisture forecast as well. So that data from the satellite that comes off um, programs such as IRISAT is then combined through a machine learning algorithm and that allows us to then predict um, soil tensions or soil moisture into the future for a seven day period. So that we can use that for auto water ordering and also planning when we, when we next irrigate. Um, so what, it's amazing the amount of sources of technology that we're pulling in to be able to uh, control the systems. And a lot of this is, is definitely within its infancy. So you know what we're working on is what the right sensor and control mixes are into the future. Uh, it's all controlled through a dashboard. So um, with that, the grower or the irrigator has full control. So he can manually come into the dashboard. Um, he can control individual watering gates. Um, what he can also do as well though, is set it up to run in an autonomous fashion. So for instance, the sensor in this field, he could set that irrigation event to tr trigger at a certain soil moisture content and then um, water that bay until it gets to a particular height within the bay and then that order, irrigation would then continue on um, throughout the system. So it's got the ability to run within an autonomous fashion um, based off that sensor and control data. We also have within that uh, dashboard as well a range of sensor data that we can uh, pick up and use as well. So I've got soil moisture tension, tensions here for example and also um, a soil saw temperatures as well, and also forecast and observe um, ranges of those. So uh, one of the questions we always get is what does this technology cost? Um, like I mentioned, the seasonal auto winches are around about 1600 Australian dollars per outlet. Um, we tend to find that sensing automation to set it up in this context for an Australian irrigator is somewhere between two to $600 per hectare. Um, that range is affected by things such as bay size. Um, so obviously if you've got a smaller bay, it costs more per bay because you've got that in increased control on smaller bays with increased seasonal auto winches. And it's also affected by the level of sensing that you, you may wish to do um, on your property as well in terms of the intensity of that, that sensing network. But there are systems that are being provided through commercial providers um, within that two to $600 um, per hectare range. 
So just in summary, uh, smart sensing and automation in surface irrigation systems is rapidly increasing across Australia. There's a number of commercial growers and you'll hear from, from some a little bit later on um, about their experiences, but the adoption is, is um, ramping up dramatically. But these technologies are essentially packaging years of knowledge that you know a number of people have done across the globe on irrigation research, such as soil moisture monitoring, crop, evap crop evapotranspiration, um, how we best manage irrigation uh, into an easy to management system that, that optimises water use and reduces labour cost. Um, like I mentioned too, it's technology that's already available by commercial providers and it's being used on large scale farms across Australia. So hopefully when you get out to the irrigation conference, an opportunity to come out and have a look at some of these um, in the field um, being being operated. Some of the future research needs um, from our end that uh, I think need particular work is particularly around focusing on optimising sensor and the automation mix. So um, those costs, whether it's at the two to six hundred dollar per hectare range, I think we can get a lot closer to the to the lower end of the range with the right sensing mix on the automation. And also, I think some further analysis, particularly around the data analytics on on how we control. So that's uh, that's it from me. There's a couple of website links up there. I think this presentation will be available after the um, after the webinar that you can get a copy and, and have a look at. Um, contact details up there if you've got any um, further um, inquiries for me and also check out our industry partner websites um, and they've got information in terms of sensor networks and the automation controls that, that they offer um, as well. So I'll leave it there and uh, hand it back to Eric. Um, or Joe to, to move Thank on you. to the next presentation. Thank you very much, John. That was a very uh, interesting discussion. And uh, of course, you've been working very closely with James as well as a number of other farmers. And we look forward to hearing some of uh, those comments about how the system's working practically on the farm. I'm going to uh, then uh, change uh, uh, over to, uh, to Joe Foley. And um, Joe will go straight in and present uh, his component of work, which is working on some some different irrigation systems, but with a, a wide range of experiences. So you should be able to take control. So you can see my full screen there now. Thank you all for attending, and it's um, good to see some familiar names there on the on the attended list. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I'm Joseph Foley, an agricultural engineer specialising in irrigation engineering, and I'm based at the um, University of Southern Queensland with the Centre for Agricultural Engineering. We have had a long history of engagement around the irrigation and water management space, and essentially um, we've had a focus towards optimising and improving uh, broadacre irrigation systems, whether they be um, the uh, larger cotton and grain farms or sugarcane and or dairy pasture properties. So these, to give you an idea, we've got an, a number of staff here based at the centre in Toowoomba in Queensland, Australia, including engineers from the agricultural and hydraulic fields, uh, Dr Malcolm Gillies, mechatronic engineers, Dr. Alison McCarthy, and other technical specialists who help us out on these projects. So the work we do has really been focused around in the past, giving people a visual understanding of the performance of irrigation systems, whether they be gated pipe and fluming systems, such as the G-pipe system, whether they be hydraulic uh, systems, such as center pivot and lateral move, or in uh, furrow irrigation and surface irrigation optimization, with packages like Cisco. These tools allow us to um, provide a very good visual display to growers about the performance of the irrigation system. And the work we've been doing has been building on that over many years to help with the optimization and design of a whole range of irrigation systems, whether they be pressurized sprinkler systems like traveling guns or center pivots and lateral moves. The basis for our work kicked off really when um, after measuring many, many surface irrigation events, we could show clearly that under farmer management, application efficiency in field on farm was down around the 50% level in a quite a number of 
irrigation events. So our work had measured something in the order of about 800 uh, irrigation events. And of those, uh, roughly half were performing where only a half of the water applied to the field went into the root zone. By some simple optimization and improvement, we could show that we could lift the performance there from that mid 50s range up into the, into the 70s, um, ensuring that we actually minimize the deep drainage and the loss of water down through the bottom of the profile, leaching away fertilizer and nutrient. And it's on this basis that further work was completed to develop a control engineering technology called VeryWise by Dr. Ellison McCarthy to actually um, automatically sense and measure um, centre pivot systems or far irrigated fields and take in a range of different measurement systems, use the control engineering technology with um, well proven crop models that are globally adapted and then optimise the irrigation application and timing, not in just in terms of the depth of water applied, but also working towards maximising the yield. The other major piece of work that our centre has been involved with over two decades now has been optimising surface irrigation. And by measuring these events in the field, on farm, and being able to use the great work of Dr Malcolm Gillies to calibrate the Cisco model and actually uh, determine the infiltration parameters for the Kostyakov equation, we can simulate and evaluate the surface irrigation performance. And then over time, with repeated irrigations, we can work towards optimising the time to cut off or the inflow duration and the uh, rate that occurs. It's this work that led us six years ago to develop an idea to automate this entire process and ensure that we had that sensor system working in the field operating with and sending information to models operating on computer servers, and then being able to actually control things back in the field themselves with large automated gates and telemetry systems that send the information to them. So this vision was really about the build up of a long period of work where we had completed many, many field irrigation event uh, assessments. And based on that, uh, work and the understanding of how we could improve performance on farm. That irrigation performance being quite widely varied across the farm, even on the same property or across in different regions altogether, we figured that growers could improve irrigation performance and make more dollars per megalitre, either by growing more crop or by actually saving on the water that they're actually applying in field instead of having to buy it. But in many instances, the information we provided was uh, such that it was too hard for the grower to implement. And this led us to uh, working towards automated systems that adaptively control the irrigation from field supply all the way through to the, to the water itself using sensors and irrigation software models in the background. So our belief at that time was that we can deliver quite large steps in irrigation performance across industries by implementation of this automation system. And essentially, that system controls, looks, that system looks like in the top left, a range of sensors that operate in the field, whether they be the very wise camera systems, um, intelligent soil moisture sensors, and other means to determine crop evapotranspiration and soil variability with EM38 systems. To be able to take that data and store it in databases that are commercially available already, and then use the very wise irrigation control logic and in surface irrigation, the Cisco hydraulic systems, to then be able to control large gates back at the field and automate the fire irrigation, in this case, using the likes of the Rubicon system to do that. And that can occur then across a whole range of fields and subfields, which typically range in size in the fields that we operate in from 12 hectares up to 18 hectares per unit across a field that ranges in size from 100 hectares total to 200 hectares in total. In the background with these systems, there's always some grower and, and farmer oversight of what is occurring. So these systems now 
have been implemented for five years and we've been automating those FARO systems with the likes of the small pipe through bank system, a modification of FARO irrigation where small pipes of 75 millimetre diameter are fed through um, electrically actuated one by one metre size gates and each of these 18 hectare bays in, in an example case here of 108 hectares is fully automated to allow that um, automation of the fire irrigation event itself. So in those same systems, um, in the likes of other valleys in the uh, other regions in Australia, we've been able to determine the furrow irrigation performance and the hydraulics via the simple pipe outlet elevations and a surveying process arranged there, taking in soil moisture data, using a range of different um, heat sensing camera systems, including the irrimate analysis onto the web to actually drive the whole process and combining these data sets to make the optimal decision each irrigation event um, and control those uh, fields so that you can actually apply the right quantity of water at the right time. Those systems um, certainly have been now operating for, uh, for the five years or more, both in the cotton regions and also from the great work of Dr. Malcolm Gillies with the activity in North Queensland, um, op automating large sugarcane fields. In this case, there's an example here with an 85 hectare block, uh, 80, 85 hectare field, cut into seven different irrigation bays, if you like. Each of these bays is over a kilometre in length, and we have a channel fed irrigation scheme supplying water. Each of those then have low pressure buried pipeline systems which automate and actuate valves to deliver water through flumes, which then that fluming runs cups of water out into each furrow. The range of sensors we've incorporated in those systems include ultrasonic flow meter sensors, uh, soil moisture sensors, pressure sensors to determine the depth. All of these systems allow us to um, can automatically control the irrigation event in the field. And in amongst all this is the important backbone of the telemetry sensor information delivery system that's occurring. In addition to the work in fire irrigation, we have quite a lot of work been occurring by Dr. Ellison McCarthy and team in relation to variable rate irrigation on centre pivots. And those have occurred across cotton and a range of other horticultural crops and now into work with the dairy pastures in northern Tasmania, um, some 2,000 kilometres away, to automate and essentially determine uh, daily prescription maps, which are loaded automatically into the control panels in these systems uh, to generate prescription irrigation on a daily basis or as needed. So these systems have led us, and this combination of work we've done over much time, have led us to a range of other technologies which I, I felt that the audience would find also to be quite interesting, including a UAV thermal and visual detection by cameras of irrigation advance fronts. And these systems and the PhD work of Dr. Derek Long have allowed us to automate the process for fire irrigation further in different ways. We've also been able to include a range of different telemetry and information systems that transfer via LP WAN systems, simple dumb soil moisture data and irrigation water advance data into systems that allow us to control the irrigation events. Other cheap smartphone technologies that we've been able to employ at times have included automated level sensor systems built on the back of smartphone cameras using the Android app technology. And these have performed quite well for us. So as a result, we now have large remote control broad acre irrigation systems that may or may not perform optimally. And the work we continue to do is to assist growers who already do this irrigation quite well to do it more easily and to nail the optimal irrigation process every single time in these large broad acre fields. So this adaptive autonomous irrigation development continues from to develop our work from the water supply right through 
to the irrigation field itself. And then as we continue this work, we have the ability to irrigate the right amount of water at the right time, at the right place, every time, so that we can optimise using our the crop models and irrigation hydraulic models, the maximum crop yield or the maximum water savings, depending on the outcome that we wish to achieve. That wraps up my presentation here this evening and thank you all for your attendance. I'm happy to take any questions by email um, across the range of technologies that we have available for the discussion. So thank you for listening this evening. Thank you very much, um, Joe, once again for your uh, presentation there. We've had two very interesting uh, presentations now from, uh, from yourself and John. Um, can you see my screen again, hopefully? Okay, yes. so I, uh, what, what we would like to do now is move into a, uh, a panel discussion session. Um, we've heard a lot about the technologies that have been uh, developed uh, by uh, the team and across the country for automation in, in irrigation. But it's really important for us to understand the practicalities of that extent to which it's making a difference on the farm, in the field. So we're very fortunate to have uh, James Toskin and Aaron Linton uh, with us today. Uh, John works closely with uh, James and, uh, and Joe and, and his team work closely with Aaron. Um, so I'll introduce them both briefly and then we have a few questions. Uh, James is an irrigator from Griffith in New South Wales. Uh, they run a surface irrigated farm in the southern areas of New South Wales and their main crops are cotton, maize and wheat, uh, and they use automated bankless channel irrigation systems. Uh, quite different to that is uh, the work that um, Aaron Linton, who's an irrigator from far north in the Burdekin area of Queensland, uh, and uh, they produce sugarcane, beans, soya beans, peanuts, and they have a mixture of furrow irrigation as well as subsurface drip. Um, and all of the farm is now controlled by a single automated irrigation system. What we would like to do is um, pose a number of questions to the uh, the panel, which includes Joe and John, of course. And uh, there, there are four questions there, which um, we'll direct in a moment. But we were really interested to hear a little bit about um, how automation has made a difference on the farm and what are the main benefits that have been um, achieved through automation on the farm. The second question, you know, collaboration, multidisciplinary research, that seems to me to be very important. So. How are our researchers working closely with farmers and commercial companies and what difference is that making? The third question is around barriers to adoption. Technology frightens many of us, uh, automation frightens many of us, particularly in uh, some of the uh, smaller scale irrigation systems. So we would like to get a bit of an understanding in terms of what are some of the early steps farmers are able to make and, and how these systems that are being used are being uh, extended into other farming communities and then lastly get a bit of insights on the future tools that that the panel see are uh, are critical to irrigation so perhaps um, i could uh, turn that question the first question over to to aaron and uh, and james perhaps james if you could james tell us a little bit about your uh, your farming operation and in particular uh, how automation has helped you what difference has it made for you in your farming operation we, we'd, we'd like to hear that James, can you unmute? Can you unmute? Can't hear you yet. Right, you guys can hear me now? Got you. Okay, no worries. Uh, th thanks a lot, Eric. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so a bit of background on our farming enterprise. Uh, we run it was about 2,000 hectares worth of um, irrigation. Um, so mainly, uh, yeah, half half can be uh, summer. Um, so 1,000 hectares through the summer and 1,000 hectares in the winter at any time. That's our crop rotation. And uh, traditionally, um, we had irrigated down the slope with uh, with poly poly pipes, 75 mil to 63 mil poly pipes. Um, 
yeah, irrigating down down one grade. Um, so we we kind of we may took the process of probably five or six years ago at um, at changing our layout for a, a few different reasons. Um, uh, we have we got some uh, challenging soil types here that we deal with, and um, so one of those. Well, I guess the way the way we went with our system uh, was the bankless channel system. So, um, yeah, we turned it into terraced bays um, with about 150 mil slope between the bays. And one of the benefits of going that way was we we were able to automate this system. So, oh, probably about three years ago, we we went down the path of automation. Um, we started dealing with uh, Padman Stops, who were supplying. Uh, us with the the concrete structures for our for our system, and they started going down the down the path of automation. So we started dipping our toe in into that. Uh, yeah, about three years ago now. And initially, we started with um, some quite low cost, uh, movable um, pieces of technology um, that uh, yeah were able to move across the farm. As John had one of the one of the systems there up earlier, um, we could move from winch to winch and get a certain amount of control across our irrigation layer and straight away we were just we uh we found the benefits um yeah to be uh yeah through the roof so we're able to um first of all our, our biggest thing was our labor reduction so for us to irrigate our property it was a 10 to 15 man job pulling siphons morning and night and that could be easily managed by one or two one or two men so there was a cost saving there um, and I guess also the water savings we were finding we weren't over irrigating our bays um, and we weren't getting the I guess the through through drainage that uh, that Joseph uh, spoke about earlier um, and we we're just we we're finding a yeah five to ten percent water saving um, straight off the bat through that um and i guess in terms of managing the whole the whole thing um uh john spoke about earlier we're able to to concentrate on other facets of the business um why this was going on in the background and we found that to be yeah um just the ease of management um to be very beneficial to other parts of our business we weren't weren't running around changing siphons all time all through the through the night and uh throughout the day so so that natural progression for us going from those movable timers, um, this year we've fully implemented a um, autonomous irrigation layout right across our summer cropping program, across, yeah, just under a thousand hectares. Um, and we're really excited to see the to see the benefits from that. And um, I guess to implement some of the things that, that John's been working on with his sensors and uh, get the full the full benefit from that. Thank you very much, James. It seems that it's been a, a learning curve for you and, and working closely with the researchers, with your commercial suppliers and, and, and learning. Um, and I think, um, you know, Aaron, you've been in a similar system, I guess, very different irrigation environment, but uh, you've also been in the game of uh, transitioning to automation. Could you share some of your uh, experiences and uh, some of the advantages that it's brought to your farming operation? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, we we grow uh, sugarcane here on drip irrigation and flood irrigation and we also grow some rotational crops of mung beans and soybeans and uh, now peanuts. Um, we've been traditionally manually irrigating through throughout. Our, our issue here is not uh, water, we've got plenty of water. Um, it's cost of water also adds up. Um, so our we're sort of water rich and land poor. We don't have big areas like James talks about. Um, so we've got to maximise what we do have um, to get the most crop off it we can. Um, I've been down a journey over the last eight to 10 years um, through started the drip irrigation and um, in the sugar cane, which was reasonably new at that stage to, to any of this area anyway, with the knowledge and I had to learn a fair bit about um, how much water we're applying and and when to apply it. And then I've been working with local um, 
local irrigation agronomists here, Steve Adard, and um, and a few other guys around there. And we decided um, my farm is about 35 k's away from kilometres away from our um, original home farm, and we automated the drip irrigation, and uh, it was becoming a pain. Like James was saying, is you have to go around and basically open and shut these valves to flood irrigate the rest of the rest of the block. And we decided uh, to look down the path of automating the flood irrigation. And through the, the through this project, um, we've done that and it's been really good. And we've learnt a lot about, because now it's automated, every single time that the pump turns on or a little bit of water's applied, everything's recorded because it's it's all computerized before you sort of your best guess i suppose you know a lot of farmer a farmer knowledge but um yeah you're still it's still under your best guess now we've got all the data there and we can really improve our irrigation efficiencies and our water use and and cut cut our costs right back on power and, and different timings of irrigation and stuff like that so um it's been been a good journey along the way. Well, thank you for those insights there, Aaron, as well. I mean, it's really interesting. You're talking a lot about uh, surface irrigation, you know, furrow or bank this channel automation. We often think about automation being, you know, just drip irrigation or pressurized center pivots, but it's it's really interesting that you can make some real improvements to what is often thought of as being an inefficient. Uh, surface or flood irrigation system, which is actually not the case. Automation can add a lot of value. Um, I'd, I'd really be uh, interested to hear from uh, Joe and, your, and John, your thoughts. I mean, I know the program that you're working on, which is a national program, it, uh, one of the strengths is it brings together the researchers uh, with commercial companies, working with the farmers, and it strikes me that that's a, it's been a good model for us all. Uh, can you give some of your thoughts uh, Perhaps, Joe, you could go first around uh, that experience and how the importance of that. Yes, that has been um, very important, Eric, because it's 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 one thing to actually develop the technology in the laboratory and at the university and deploy it over a hectare or two, and and then run it on trials of, of a couple of hectares, you know, three or four hectares on a local property. But it's another matter altogether to actually roll that out at a commercial scale. In our first year, we were able to you know, automate 100 hectares of cotton irrigation in one hit. And that doesn't come just by yourself. You, you're working with commercial operators like Rubicon, with the likes of Wiser, with a range of other major players who have already got the capacity to do some of the automation. And the combination of new sensors and new data systems allows us then to get better and better feedback to growers. And so it's that combination of working with commercial scale um, operators, both at the manufacturing level for the equipment and also for the growers uh, operating in large real scale sizes, not just trial sizes, that then very simply translates to other growers as this is for real. This is something we could also implement and actually make happen at, at my whole farm scale. And that's been what's been able to occur over the last five years. John, you John, John had uh, some other Yeah, yeah pr probably just to reiterate what Joe said. I mean, we've been really lucky within our um, project to have two great industry partners um, with Padman Automation and Goanna Ag. Um, I think some of the technologies and just the applications that Padman are bringing out in surface irrigation automation are really exciting. I really enjoy working with industry. I think that they have a, um, a focus on really getting products out there that are going to be used. So that helps sharpen up our research um, and it helps us focus. So I think that's really important. And I also think the, the combination of working with those industry partners that are on large scales, such as Padman, um, putting out automation technology and then working with those farmers, 
um, is really important. And I think the, you know, it's really good when you've got an industry partner um, such as Padnam that, that, that's interesting, uh, interested in taking on board the research components, but also getting feedback from the growers on how their um, products need to evolve or, or what they need to do. And then I think that then gets a, gets something at the end of the project and at the end of the process that's um, really adoptable by a large number of farmers. And I think that's probably why you're seeing some big gains that's happening in the automation space um, very quickly in that you've got those, got those links there. I think another thing, which is an observation from my side, which has been a great outcome of the program you're working on, is it is a national program. It's working across four or five major cropping systems um, and it's uh, multiple multiple industries, multiple research groups. Uh, a big program funded by the government is often required to do this sort of stuff. There's a lot of learning between different research groups. Technologies that are being used in cotton can be transferred into other regions uh, to pastures, say, or to sugar, and vice versa. Uh, and so there's been a lot of learning across different uh, parts of our irrigation research community. I, I hopefully you can still see the research, the questions that are up on the screen there. I think the uh, the third one for me, uh, which is probably one for Aaron and, and James again, is about barriers to adoption. I mean, we often think that automation is too hard. I'd be keen to hear what have been the difficulties you've faced and what have been the barriers to adoption of these sorts of technologies. And in particular, you know, can you start on a small scale or do you have to go the whole hog first up? Do you have to invest a lot of money to go to a fully automated system or are there small steps that you can take uh, to start to get used to the technologies? Aaron, what have been your experiences on that? Um, you don't have to go the full hog to automate your whole farm. Uh, you get the most benefit out of it when you do, I believe. Um, I think the first things you would do is automate or maybe not automate, but um, look at your infrastructure and what you're actually doing now and start to monitor what you're doing to start from there and see where you could you improve. So getting some of the the automated uh, water meters and, and things like that and doing some Cisco runs to make sure that you actually are irrigating efficiently and see if you can improve there. And then you can, it's no use automating a, an inefficient system is basically what I'm trying to say. Um, so make sure your system's efficient and then automate from there and, and move on and um, you can make great gains into into what you're doing. I think it's true that uh, very often you can make significant gains with uh, a, a limited amount of investment. You don't have to invest a large amount to make all those gains. Uh, incremental improvement can happen quite quickly at, uh, at the first, first part of your automation. Um, James, what have been your, your thoughts about uh, you know, barriers to adoption and, and the opportunity to, to, to step slowly into it? Yeah, so I guess it's about um, having a confidence in the technology um, and being able to dip dip your toe in at a relatively low cost is, is big because um, it is a big expense um, if you're going over hundreds of, hect hundreds of hectares. Um, it, it does, yeah, it adds up really quickly. So um, yeah, what Aaron said, doing a, having an on-farm review of your current, of your current system um, is pivotal to see what you can automate um, to begin with. Um, but I guess, um, yeah, just having that confidence in the technology, dealing with it for a, for a couple of years until you feel until you feel confident in the way um, the way you want to go. I, I know on first hand that's the way way we went. Um, just uh, starting off small and then and then making that decision once we were confident. So yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think there's uh, the other important part of that is having good companies to work with who can provide the technology and who are supportive. I think we see globally now a huge uh, expansion in innovation in irrigation technology, precision irrigation. One of the challenges to know, you know, what systems to use and compatibility. And I, I'm sure that working with uh, good suppliers has been something that you've uh, you've both had uh, had as an important part of your, your steps. Uh, and, and I think the whole um, being able to collect a lot of data and, and, and provide it to you on your phone via um, you know, decision support tools 
has made a huge difference to you. Um, as we continue just working through the last question, um, I just urge uh, you know the audience to uh, use your chat uh, option or your question option and any questions you'd like to pose, uh, you could put up there and then, um, as I say, we have a large number of people, but uh, we can certainly select a few questions and uh, put them to our, our panel. They'd love to provide some insights. And, and as was offered early on, uh, not all the questions likely could be answered um, now, but uh, we can certainly, uh, you can have access to email um, and we can then provide some, some answers to your questions at the later stage. Um, I guess the, uh, the, the last uh, question is for, for all of you. Um, it's really about what's the future? You know, what are the future, what are the missing gaps that we need to be looking at for uh, improving, you know, water productivity? Um, and, and, and I guess part of that is, uh, as I often think, is linking in what's happening on the farm to where the water supply is coming from. You know, who's your supplier? And is your supplier able to pro provide the water to you in a way that you can then automate it? So I'm keen to hear um, from each of you, perhaps a, a brief uh, high end, um, your, your estimate of what's the most uh, important future tools that need to be developed. And perhaps, Joe, just a comment from you first around uh, linking into your supplier. Is, is that an important uh, area? It certainly is. And as, as both James and, and Aaron and many other growers will recognise, the ability of the Water Supply Authority to provide water when it's needed and at the flow rate that it's required on farm is absolutely critical in actually ensuring that the automation system works smoothly. I've been fortunate to work on a range of large properties that have essentially their own uh, water supply system within the farm boundaries because they're quite large properties and in, in that circumstance they are the masters of their own destiny in terms of water supply. But in many parts of the world, we are having to certainly very nicely integrate in with the large water supply authorities to ensure that evenness and consistency of water supply of what is needed and what can come from that. And what we've seen, and John will attest to this, John Hornbuck will attest to this, what we've seen with the great work of Rubicon Water in, in the southern parts of Australia has been that um, when growers get a real confidence about this water supply delivery system and being able to water on a, on a short time interval, you know, one day or two days, and actually ensure they uh, obtain that water at the flow rate that they desire to integrate in with their automation system, there is immediately a confidence builds in both parties and the overall demand then from growers actually reduces as they gain greater confidence in the water supply authority. This leads to substantial saving at that interface between the irrigator, between the farmer and the water supply authority. And when we can work together like that, um, the whole scheme then actually functions at a far better um, you know, performance level, where there's not um, wasteful or overzealous ordering of water by growers and farmers, and there's not an oversupply because of risk by the water supply authority when they're truly integrated. John Hornbuckle, you may have some further comment on, on the importance of, of that as well. Yeah, Joe, I mean, I think that's obvious that um, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So, um, you know, what you really need to do is ensure that your whole delivery infrastructure is up to scratch. Um, we're fortunate in Australia that there's been a, a large amount of federal government money that's been spent on that, particularly in the southern parts of the, the um, irrigation areas. So really our challenge now is to provide low cost on farm automation. And I think, you know, it's only really been recently that that's actually been available. So I think a lot of the challenges that we've had, but it's exciting time. I think that um, the technology is now down at a cost per hectare um, that, it, that it can be adopted on farm. And that's where I think we'll, we'll start to see some really big savings um, in terms of uh, maximi 
maximizing productivity from that water resource. I think the other thing, just to make a, a, a point there too, around future tools, I think it's about also having the irrigation industry as a whole willing to, um, you know, adopt this technology. So whether that's an irrigation company provider from the delivery side of things, or, you know, irrigators yeah. such as James and Aaron that are willing to take on these technologies, um, you know, give them the thrashing and, and make sure that um, they're delivering what they need. So I think, you know, having that um, that foresight to see where it's heading, I think is important as well. James and Aaron, as, uh, from, a, from a, 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 an end user perspective, someone who's got to make a, make a profit out of farming, out of irrigation, um, got environmental um, awareness of course which is also important what what's missing for you what do you think the next step needs to be uh, for irrigated agriculture in your environment James perhaps you wanted to have a have a first stab and then we'll hand over to Aaron yeah I guess it's the um it is the education from from researchers um yeah down to the farmer down to the end user as we as uh, Joe and John uh, spoke about it's the um, yeah, it's the end user at the end of the day using that water and, and the deliverers of the water um, need that data to be able to, um, yeah, man, ma maximise the productivity of that water. So, um, yeah, I just think that it's the collaboration from a farmer perspective with researchers um, and the suppliers actually supplying the automation equipment and just giving the people the confidence um, and the incent oh, financial incentives would would be good as well um, to uh, yeah give the farmer a kick in the right direction I guess. Yeah, we um, we farm in uh, a reef catchment area here in North Queensland, so the irrigation um, runoff on our farms uh, is a very big big thing that we need to look after. So the environmental factor is a huge um, benefit by having automation and being able to limit the amount of runoff, irrigation runoff off our farms. So there's a big plus there um, that I think doesn't probably get enough accolades. Um, as for the future, where we would like to go, I personally would like to see, okay, we're talking autonomous, but at the moment, we're not really autonomous. We've got automation, but it's not autonomous. Um, I'd like to see um, some more sensors or crop sensors and, and actually make the system autonomous where the farmer is is an overseer but not actually a controller. Um, we have started a little bit with um, the local university, uh, JCU, and we've now been, we've developed this uh, program called Uplink, we've called it. And it takes all my irrigation data and links it and uploads it to a crop model, um, IriWeb. And um, so every time my pump starts, it goes on the crop model and I know where my um, soil water deficit is in that model. Um, we've mucked around a little bit with uh, a program we're calling Downlink to see if we can turn it back around the other way and come back into my computer and program what the pump start and off it goes. And when we've been uh, playing with that and it's working on the drip irrigation system, it's been phenomenal. And uh, I think more, more work should be done on, on those sort of technologies, um, but we've got to do a few bit more work on the, getting the confidence with the crop model or um, moisture probes or sensors all to talk together and try and make, um, come out with the best opportunity that's that's where I think that we could go with with this it's yeah it's the uh, options are endless thank you very much for that uh, look there's some questions coming in now which is great to see and I might direct some of them through to you I uh, will whilst I'm doing that uh, you might see on the slide uh, the link towards uh, the conference that's to come hopefully you can see that on the on the screen now so please take note of that uh, that link for the forthcoming conference, which uh, will allow you to uh, put in abstracts and, and find further information. There's also a link to the uh, program, which uh, the team have spoken to today, and a range of different videos that, uh, that can give you a, a closer understanding as to what, what they are doing. So please um, 
you know, make sure that you can follow up on those links and get access to that material. Um, I, uh, we have about 10 minutes to go, and I'd like to just pick up on one question that was raised regarding the, uh, the need for skilling your staff. Uh, perhaps, James, that's a, a question for you. Has it been important to, to upskill your staff for maintenance and management? It's all new technology, and, and what have been your experiences there? Uh, yeah, it's been really important. Um, and luckily, um, a lot of oh, a lot of our guys have um, taken that with both hands, and it's actually attracted probably um, some younger guys to come into our business. They've seen what we've been doing. Um, yeah, so that's um, yeah, it's, we've been lucky that our our staff have adopted it really well. But it's um, as it, it is completely new, completely new, different way of irrigating. So yeah, it's um, upskilling our staff has been really important. Thank you for that, um, James. Um, and another question, um, thank you again for sending them through, is, is around um, the, uh, the situation in, in, in developing countries where often you have uh, many farmers, 80% of farmers in India have less than two hectares of land and, and mostly they're using surface irrigation, using you know, paddy fields and the like. What are the opportunities to modernize uh, these uh, surface irrigation methods in very small landholding situations? I mean, interestingly, I'm doing a bit of, I've been doing a bit of work um, in India as, as well as uh, Bangladesh and, and Nepal. And certainly we're finding when you know, you're irrigating in the dry season into, into open bays, uh, the, the distribution uniformity of that water is, is very, very poor. And you're getting very poor production as a result and a lot of wastage and low application efficiencies and simply by by creating some uh, some furrows short furrows for your uh, dry season crop um, or ivy season crop you you're able to 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 concentrate your water and get it to tr travel the distance across the field uh, much easier and enable you're able to then provide some basic automation to uh, provide that water at the field but i'd be interested in your comments uh, john you're doing a fair bit of work in Laos and cambodia can you provide some insights in terms of small scale farmer automation? Yeah, no, I think um, like you mentioned there, Eric, I think there's steps to, you know, processes we've gone through. I think one of the things that I find interesting is in developing countries, done a lot of work in places like Cambodia is that I think they don't take as long as what we do because they can see in terms of the steps that say Australia's progress through. So we've actually been involved in Cambodia um, on similar size fields, setting up small scale laser levelers and having contractors that are um, totally independent. Um, so not government funding that can do small scale laser leveling um, that below hectare base size. And that's the first step towards, you know, um, getting a, a framework to be able to automate off. Um, one of the interesting things, if you look at a lot of the technologies that we're talking about, um, definitely a lot of the um, circuitry and components um, can be uh, potentially developed at low cost. Um, and I think if you look as well that, um, you know, there's probably some potential there to be able to, you know, offer extremely low cost um, automation solutions when you look to the future in sort of a, a five to 10 year time frame um, that, that could be applicable to some of those um, some of those situations. So I think it's, it's a process that, um, you know, you go through in terms of automation. I think, you know, getting your, your field conditions right is the first step. I think the second step is actually having some form of sort of uh, maybe just something like a very simple soil moisture sensor or, you know, some way to measure how your irrigation is performing. And then after that, looking at how you may automate it. So I think there's a process there um, potentially that you can go through. So I wouldn't be... Um, uh, you know, I definitely think in the in the medium term, um, there'll be options available um, for those sort of situations um, with with automation technologies. So I think a follow up question that uh, has come through to that is: Is there a minimum area for any crop for installation of automation? And I I suspect the answer is no. There's not a minimum area, given what you've explained. Uh, it's about a staged approach. You can start on a very small area, small scale you know, less than two hectares, and you can do some basic changes to your layout, and you can move some 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 to, to system improvements, uh, even at that very small scale, all the way to uh, large, more than 100 hectare fields. Is that, a, is that a fair comment? 
Yeah, I think it's just a trade-off between um, costs. So obviously the, um, the the infrastructure on a smaller scale or smaller base size um, increase your cost per unit. So um, if you can get your cost per unit down, um, well then it, it opens up more um, for those smaller scale, ba scale bays for sure. Another question which perhaps Joe and, and, and Aaron, you might want to, to look at, it's about uh, automation versus manual irrigation in cotton and sugarcane. Can you give uh, the listeners some idea of what the typical yields are in cotton, Joe, and, and perhaps Aaron in, in sugarcane? And then what, what the typical water savings have been in your experience as you've moved into the systems that we've spoken about? Joe, perhaps you could talk to cotton and then Aaron can talk to uh, sugarcane. Yes, thanks, Eric, and thanks for the questioner. Um, the, certainly the Australian uh, average yield for cotton uh, is hovers around the 10.5 bales per hectare. Those bales are 227 kilograms each. So um, in that order of, um, you know, 2,300, 2,400 kilograms of, of lint per hectare. And that is, um, you know, that is a very uh, reasonable yield in compared to the world. We have one of the, we're fortunate to have one of the higher average average yields for the country. Um, and at, at roughly $500 Australian uh, a bale, um, you can certainly start to see that there's some reasonable income there. Um, the typical water savings that we've monitored over, you know, two decades now, when you optimise fire irrigation in the likes of cotton systems, uh, that deep drainage component is typically in the 10 to 15 percent of your entire um, water applied and that is a direct saving that when you optimize you could actually use to expand irrigated area or as uh, to sell uh, that water on a tradable market as we have in Australia. Aaron you might like to comment on the sugar cane. Um, so our area yields here in, in this district in uh, North Queensland, I think the average last year was 116 and a half tonnes per hectare of, um, of crop, of sugarcane. Um, my savings haven't been in the water use. I've actually been able to use my water more efficiently by what I've learnt and, and been monitoring through, through the automation system, uh, which then has in turn into more yield per hectare. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, the time is now running out on us. I'd like to tackle one more question if we could, because I think it's a really important one um, and it's possibly to James, yourself and, and Aaron just to, to wrap up. Um, it's really about where, where have you seen the most benefit? Is it in the water saving? Is it in the uh, labour saving? Is it, uh, or is it perhaps in improved production or is it possibly in energy costs? Can you give us, uh, James, first and then Aaron, where, what have been the main benefits from that perspective, water, labour, energy or, or productivity, or is it not really a combination? I, I think it really is a, a combination um, of water and labour for us. Um, yeah, seeing five to 10% uh, water, uh, better water efficiencies, of, of water savings, sorry, um, and just the labour and management side of the system um, the labour costs associated um, with our old system and the savings we are getting getting now, they're the two main ones. Um, the energy energy savings is something we're still uh, tackling with, um, with our pumping systems. Um, but down the track, yeah, in terms of in terms of automating our, our pumping on farm, um, yeah, you can definitely see the energy savings there. Yeah, and I, I think all of the above, Eric, um, our, our labour saving um, has been huge because it's only, used, it's only myself that runs this um, farm. So my time is greatly reduced in the need to, to be on farm. I don't have to be there. I've got a young family and the social, the social implications of that have been great. I know we're running a business, but Without the automation, I may have had to employ a person to be able to still see my kids. Um, and the power tariffs that we use now, um, I'm using the cheapest power tariff that I can find at the moment. And that just so happens to be that you have to work every weekend to get the cheapest power. 
with the automation, it gives me that ability to, to for the, all the pumps to run and my farm to be irrigated on the weekend without without setting foot there. And I can still monitor it from wherever I am. Um, as long as I've got internet, I can I can check out what's going on and and keep going like that. So there's been yeah, all of all of those reasons are great reasons to be able to do it. Thank you for that. Look, I think we'll uh, we'll need to wrap it up. Then there are a couple more questions uh, that have been provided, but um, we we need to draw the line and finish off on time. Um, I uh, I really would like to thank everyone, uh, John and Joe, for your presentations, and uh, James and Aaron for your discussion in the panel session. It's been very insightful. I think uh, there's some significant uh, steps that are being made in automation. I think you've highlighted that um, it doesn't have to be done in one go. There are real opportunities to do it on a step-by-step -step basis, even for small-scale farmers. Um, we really look forward to our international conference uh, and convention uh, when the announcement is made of the date and the venue. We're sure to share that from IAL and ICID. Uh, we, we look forward to uh, inviting uh, many of you who participated today. And again, thank you for your questions and for your interest in this. Uh, to come and join us and to uh, come and see some of the work in, 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 in on the ground. Um, I'd like to again once again remind you of the links that are in the uh, on the page here to uh, the, the two websites. And um, and with that, I'd probably call it to a close and ask Mamir Mamir Varnes, who is the uh, who chairs the um, Australian division of ICED, just to say a few final closing words. Mamir. Eric, from I said central office, uh, we are seeing that uh, one of the uh, renowned experts uh, in uh, irrigation, agriculture, and micro irrigation, uh, who is working in the field of modernization of uh, irrigation and agriculture in India, he has raised hand. I think he wants to say something. So, uh, will you allow him at the moment for yes. one or two minutes? Yes, certainly. Okay, Please. Dr. Ash. Dr. Rajput, uh, are you able to hear us? Yes, I'm around. Dr. Rajput, yeah, just uh, you can uh, briefly in uh, two or three minutes, uh, you can uh, speak. Uh, two, two minutes, you can uh, take the time because now time is running out and then we'll uh, have to. Yeah. So you can uh, take uh, two minutes or so to give your views. Am I audible? Yeah, yes. yeah, you are already. Okay, thank you, Dr. Burma, for uh, this opportunity. Uh, and all the speakers, they are learned uh, persons in their own right. In fact, uh, we have been working on irrigation. And in fact, I have been working on irrigation research for the last 40 years. But our effort here in this country are mainly on micro irrigation. And perhaps uh, people have come to understand, most of the people, they they understand or they feel that only micro-irrigation is the high-efficiency irrigation system. But yes, I have uh, learned uh, in Australia, you have done uh, some very good automation practices in even one of my junior colleagues did his PhD from Australia on surface irrigation automation. And we tried the similar things to do here. Uh, but somehow uh, uh, it didn't pick up. The idea was not acceptable to uh, many, many, many people. Uh, but I think you are doing very wonderful, and micro irrigation cannot go beyond a limit. Though we are talking in India, we can go up to 70 million hectare, but I think the day is too far to reach that goal. We have just crossed 10. Uh, and there is a lot of scope of improving surface irrigation in India particularly micro, the surface irrigation, uh, the, particularly the canal irrigation efficiencies, uh, the irrigation efficiencies are as low as 38% over, overall in the country. And we need to improve. And perhaps some of the technologies that I listened to uh, today and uh, uh, the, you are the expert and you are doing on that, you would like to uh, really uh, uh, try all these technologies here uh, because we have the possibility and the large scope of improving the uh, surface irrigation, the efficiency of surface irrigation methods. And I think we'll uh, need your collaboration, cooperation and support. And I think we can go ahead and we can really do something useful for the country. Thank you, Dr. Varma, for the opportunity. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that comment. I think it was more a comment than a question, but uh, those are very, uh, yeah. very important insights. And I think we, we certainly in Australia have, have enjoyed working in a number of countries through the Australia Water Partnership, for instance, uh, in helping improve and learning from, from our collaborators overseas and also supplying information that we have. We can learn from each other. And certainly in your very large irrigation systems that you get in many of your countries, such as India, there's a there's huge opportunity to make some savings, um, and uh, and sharing these ideas with each other is is part of that, and that's why this webinar has been a, a wonderful opportunity. And again, uh, we look forward to meeting you in, uh, in 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 Australia, where we will hopefully have a whole session, which we can really talk about and, and workshop these sorts of important issues. So thank you.